to Corinthians chapter number four. All right, Pastor Eric is in Pittsfield today preaching at Journey Church, um, praying for them. They still, they still have not found a pastor, but he'll be filling in there this morning. And you may see him depending on how long I preach today. If he may. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4 and 1 through 5. So we've been in this series, Real Church, and what we're looking at is what makes, what, you know, it's not just to be called a church or to claim to be a church, but what makes a real church. And so we're looking at some, it's kind of interesting because a lot of this really is similar to what we've been looking at in our Wednesday night series, which is all about discipleship. So there's been a lot of overlap between this Sunday morning study and the Wednesday evening study. So today, though, the theme is real labor. What, uh, what comes to mind when I say labor? When we say labor, what was that? I heard the quick synonym there. What? Work. Work. He said it like that. Work. You weren't like, work. Work. So... Um, a lot of people, I've heard this before, where, where did work come from? Anybody know? Where did work come from? Where did work come from? Why do we work? And, and be, be, what, I mean, beyond the obvious, the obvious is um, because we like to eat, <laughs> we like to live, so we have to work, but, it's, but where did work come from? Yeah, Bill. Okay, when God told Adam that he had to till the ground by the sweat of his brow, is that correct or incorrect? Is that where work began? Incorrect. incorrect. Boy, you got disputed. He, hang on, hang on, hang on. So he says it's incorrect. That is not the beginning of work. I saw Deborah was shaking her head in the back too. You disagree with, with that too? I think they were like tending to the garden. Well, where, so what is the beginning? Adam seems eager to... Well, I was just going to say, God gave Adam a job to yeah, what are you going to say? Creation. creation. That is the beginning of work, is creation. Who is the first worker? Who is the first worker? God is. Now, I know you don't believe this, but there are some people that, no, 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 I'm not making a joke. What I'm saying, what I'm about to say, I, I know the, you're not making this argument, but there are people that say, well, work is part of the curse. But that is not true at all. In fact, the curse on work is what? That it's going to be, it's going to go from work to, how did you say it, Travis? Work. work. <laughs> yeah, it goes to work. So that's the curse, that we work by the sweat of our brow, that it becomes difficult, it becomes hard. But this idea of work and accomplishment, because is there not something satisfying about the accomplishment of work and achieving and when you get done and you can look back and you can say, wow, uh, I put the work in and I got the result from it. So I just wanted to begin with that idea that we are created as working creatures. We, are, we, we work through, well, in what ways do we work? In what ways have we been created to work? How do we work? What is work all about? In what ways do we work? Give me a look over there. Yes. Well, you know, some people work labor intensive. Some people work. So some people work very physically. Very physically. Some people work more on the mental side of the paperwork, reading, like filing. Like there's just, there's different degrees. Yeah. Some people work very physically. Some people work mentally or intellectually. We really all work in all of those areas. But what are you going to say, Frank? Yeah. That's pretty much everything you do is work. Sitting here listening to you is not that you're boring, but that's the part of it. It's a lot of work to it sit here and listen to me talk. I'll tell you what, I, I appreciate to, that. Just, just listen to you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> to uh, sit and listen in and to take in his work. Um, well, that's a really good point because some people, when they, are, they don't receive actively, they just sit there passively. And it's just like there's no work put in. Yeah. For some people, Yeah, it's harder work for some people, depending on, you know, their their temperamental makeup, their 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 the makeup of their brain, their neurological structure. Some people 
do much better when they can get active in their learning in, in that activity. And this kind of learning is, is a lot of work. What else is work, a quality of work? OK, now think about this. So there are, so God is the originator of work, OK? And work, it manifests itself in different ways in our lives. Now let me ask you this. What happens when we work? What happens when we work? OK? I, I, this, it's a very open-ended question I asked. I realized that you could go in a lot of different directions. So yes, actually, your point about getting tired, that's not where I was going to go, but we'll come back to that later. What happens in, yes? You get rewarded. OK. The, 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 all right, so now I'm getting a little, this is kind of the direction I wanted to go. What happens in the world when you work? There's a reward. That's one thing. But what happens in the world when you work? Okay, that goes in with the reward. Productivity. What do you mean by that? Things get better if you're working on, on something that you yeah. that you're doing. When we work, things get better. Right? <laughs> right. Work is for yes. You have a sense of accomplishment. Yeah, absolutely. What else happens because of work? We've heard progress, accomplishment, things get better, there's a reward. Wife is happy. <laughs> Your wife is happy? <laughs> How about this? When we work, new things are brought into existence. Now, we don't have the creative power that God has, obviously, but we are created in His image. When God created, God created as the they said in old times, ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. God created from nothing something new. But as we reflect the image of God, as we work, do new things come into existence? Now, not out of nothing, but from something, new things happen. And I think it's most, it's most reflect, we can, we can appreciate it probably the easiest in the arts, right? So like Bill is a painter or um, some of you may have been musicians or songwriters. So we can understand in art that when somebody works on something, a work of art that did not exist before has now been brought into the world. And by that, the world has been made better, etc. All these cool things happen. But, but it happens in other, in other ways. Like there's going to be, um, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, James, you're going into, you're in engineering now. And so what's going to happen is, you take that, those like hard sciences, people are going to work on roads and bridges and infrastructure and new ways of transportation have been advanced that never existed before. When we do this, we are created, it's as a reflection of us being created in the image of God. Even if you were part, even if you feel like your work is maybe insignificant, people feel that way, maybe, maybe somebody operates a cash register or something like that. But at the same time, your work, the labor that you put in, right, it is part of an organization that is supporting the advancement of new things. So we should think of our labor, we should think of our work as a really a reflection of the image of God. It's a good thing. It should be embraced. And so obviously, today, we're going to relate this to the work and the labor of the ministry. But really, the Christian, the Christian ethic throughout the centuries has been to understand that all work is a means of glorifying God. So in what you do, whether you're, whether you're uh, digging a hole and planting a beautiful flower or you're inserting a bit of code into the program, you're creating something. You're reflecting God's image. If you're in the classroom, I'm just thinking of what a lot of people do in here. If you're in the classroom, you're, you're, you're putting something into children that is transformative. And so in that, we reflect the image of God. Now, that labor, that work, if work is so rewarding, and if work is a reflection of the image of God, then what is the downside to work? Well, we already heard it a little bit. 
what is the downside? If, it, if Like, I just painted a pretty rosy picture, right? It's like, oh, this is amazing. So what are the downsides to work? Some of you have already said some of them. The downsides are what? Fatigue. You get tired. Mental fatigue, physical fatigue, wears you out. You get tired. What, what else? It's never finished. Yeah, isn't that amazing? God said he created, which is interesting why the Sabbath is so important. And my wife would be looking right back at me about that and she'd be like, preach that yourself when it comes to the Sabbath. The whole idea of taking a day to rest, rejuvenate, worship, refocus. That's why Sabbath is so important. If you work, even it's, because work is never done, there will always be more work to do. So God, he wasn't finished with mankind, but after six days, he said everything is good, and on the seventh day, he what? He rested. He rested, and that's been the pattern that he gave us throughout history. Work is, work. there's fatigue. It never ends. There's no end to the work. What else is the downside to work? Time, yeah. That we have, we have an, a finite amount of time. Prioritization, right? Like with all these things to accomplish, how do I prioritize my work? There's some work I enjoy more than others. There's some work that's important. Um, so all of these things, they're the downside. And the downsides, they do come from the curse that you're going to... Yes, Travis? You're also not working alone. <laughs> oh, that's a downside. <laughs> but, you know, my business, I'm working with multiple people to do like one deal. And you have to depend on others to carry their workload to finish the complete right. work. So that can be a challenge. Yeah. These are all downsides, and that's part of the fall. It's part of the fallen nature of, of man. So now let's shift gears a little bit and think about how this relates to a real church and being a real church. A church, it's really important to realize this, a church is a, is a group of people we do not just assemble to worship and grow and fellowship right? But we are to be engaged in the work of the ministry, that we come together and we work together. We serve together. That's why we've adopted the mission statement, and we didn't come up with it, um, but other churches use it. But it's the statement that, why are we here? We're here to love God. We're here to grow together. And then we're here to serve others. Love God. That's our worship growing together, that's our fellowship and our discipleship, and then serving others, that's our labor, that's our work in the ministry. Now, I have met over the years a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians who become discontented or become, they have lots of struggles or they become discouraged. I could fill in all these areas and a lot of the time, not always, it's, these things are complicated, but a lot of the time, very frequently, the people that are having the most trouble in their Christian life are not engaged in serving other people. They're not engaged in the work of the ministry. What happens to somebody when they're not serving? What happens to a person when they are not serving? So you can think of it in the work we know what happens to our society when we have created a, and I am, I'm actually, you know, some of you might disagree with me, but I am a believer. I, I do believe in the welfare system that we have in America. I believe that it has helped a tremendous amount of people, but it has a lot of serious problems with it. It has a lot of problems, and that is there are many people who have found a way to game the system, and they don't work at all when they could work, Right? And instead of me being like, oh, those people are losers, blah, 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 I should be sad for those people. Because what happens to a group of people that don't work? They don't have any self-esteem. They have no value to their life. Yeah. Right. A lot of times they turn to substances, things like that. I mean, it is a sad thing when people aren't laboring. So now let's think about it spiritually. In the, in the life of a local church, in the life of the the body of Christ, what happens when people aren't serving, when people aren't laboring together? What happens? Okay, so it affects the whole body, right? 
a lot of people say, boy, I wish our church had this. And I'm not saying here necessarily, though it could be. But a lot of people say, well, I wish we had this, or I wish we could offer this, or I wish this was part of our, uh, of our church. And it's like, well, we could have that if what? If somebody did it. If somebody got involved and, and did it. So, yeah, so Jim is right. If, if people don't serve, then something is missing that God intends for the church to enjoy. Something's missing if people aren't serving. So, 100%. What else happens to Christians who don't serve? What happens to Christians? Deborah? Yeah, you become a purposeless Christian, really. What? Yep. Yeah, that happens a lot. You become very self-absorbed. So the church becomes like a consumer. You have a consumer relationship with the church, right? This was, at one point, at one point somebody told me, um, this, this was, um, somebody told me, I, well, I'm not going to share that story. You get in trouble sometimes, so my, my conscience is telling me not to share that one. But I'll give you this example. Sometimes people, they treat their churches like their favorite restaurant, like, as long as, you know, I get, I, I have these expectations, and if I get these expectations, then I'm happy. But if I don't get these expectations, then I'll change restaurants. Now, not, now, I'm not speaking, there are legitimate issues people have, I get it. But we all need to examine our hearts and just ask that question. Like, if I, am I a consumer or am I a servant here? Travis, what were you going to say? Um, right, I kind of went in another direction after you had your hand up. So I was asking the question, what happens to people when they, when, go ahead. No, when people start to become, when, you, when you're not involved in doing things, you start to do things that you seem fit instead of what God seems fit. You start listening to yourself as opposed to the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Like you start going in your own direction. Yeah. And then those people typically you find, slowly but surely, they stop even going to church because they start becoming more dependent on themselves not being a part of anything, then it's easier to walk it's a drift. than it is to, to stay. I think you're right. There's a drift I've seen. People, people step back. Now, I've also observed people who overdo it in their service, right? They overdo it in their serving, and they just do. They're going to do everything, and they're going to serve in every way. And sometimes that comes from a couple of places. Sometimes that's from guilt that's put on people. Like there's like, well, you're expected to do this. That's not right. Sometimes it's not that at all. Sometimes people overdo it in service because they need to validate themselves, right? They feel like they are worth something if they will do all these things. So those are both unhealthy. But I think what Travis said is key. It's all about listening to the Lord, not being self-absorbed, being focused on the Lord. And maybe you are somebody who's, who, maybe there was a time you served too much or whatever. Don't have a, like, we're, we're prone to imbalance in our Christian lives, where we have knee-jerk reactions to past conditions, and we need to be on guard against that. So the question is, you know, what type of a Christian are you? What, how do you serve, and are you serving? So now let's flip it the other way. Let's change this discussion. So we've talked about what work is about, what labor is about. We've talked about the what happens to people who don't work. And then we applied it to the church. We spoke about what happens to Christians when they're not involved in serving. But now, what happens to Christians when they do embrace the role of a servant? I'll give you the very first one, and that is we are more closely conformed to the image of Christ. The moment we start serving, we are more like Christ, who reached down with a towel, and he washed the disciples' feet. So we become instantly more Christ-like if we serve from the proper motive. What else happens to Christians when they begin to serve? Adam. Uh, I would say, like, you kind of build a community with the people in your church, and you develop kind of a oneness with them um, that, that ultimately pushes the ministry forward. That's huge. There's a synergy that happens. Because when you serve shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with somebody... You, you are invested with each other for the sake of the gospel. And so your bond gets tighter. I would agree with that. that that's, that's really good. And, and then things advance exponentially. It's, it's, it's just like if you've ever ser served at camp. How many of you have ever served at like youth camp before? You've done that. And you can remember, you go back and you just don't remember the service, but you remember 
the closeness to the people you were working with, right? There's, there's a bond that happens there. It's really cool. And the same thing can happen in the church as we serve together. What else happens to a Christian who gets involved in serving? Frank? There's joy, fulfillment. Yeah, whenever we obey what God has designed us to do, we're going to experience joy. Travis? A uh, sense of, like, family. Yeah. Outside of, like, your immediate family, like, it's a sense of family because you all have one purpose together. Yep. You know, you're serving, serving the Lord, so it's always nice to be able to lean on others doing the same activities and to be able to share in that. Absolutely. Growth. Yeah, personal growth you're talking about. Spiritual growth. Yeah. Spiritual growth. What else happens? Let's, let's, like, let's zero in on that one for a minute. In what ways do we experience spiritual growth when we serve? Deborah. Yeah. How many, I mean, like, oh, Bethany. It's like an iron sharpening iron kind of thing. So when you're working with people in the ministry together, you're talking about things, spiritual things. You uh, have that community where you're discussing those things frequently. You're right, and they impact, they have real world consequences, not just theory, right? You're doing it. I think also with the iron sharpening iron and the growth and the faith, we end up doing things we never imagined ourselves doing. Like, we end up having abilities and talents that we never, ever would have imagined that we could do because we just got involved. And then other people spur us on. Like, have you ever been challenged by somebody else's commitment and energy that they put forward? We were like, man, look at how they're involved. Look at what they're doing. If they can do it, maybe by God's grace, I can do it, right? I know that sharpens me. Like, I have a lot of pastor friends that I look to and I follow them and and that has an impact on me. It's like, man, if, they're, if they can do this, and it's not a comparative thing in an unhealthy way, but it's a, it's a healthy iron sharpening iron to say, hey, if this can be done here, why can't this be done here? If that can be done in that person's life, why not in, in my life? And so we've started that now with some of, the, some of our young people. We're getting them involved in different ways, working with our children's ministry and things like that, and it's really good. It's really faith building in their in their lives. Any other thoughts on that and what happens, Adam? I would say spiritually you really should first push your God because you're when you're involved in the ministry, I think someone said it, but you kind of there's things that you put aside in your daily life or whatever that you put towards that ministry. It's so it's you're doing something that's bigger than yourself. It's like a fast almost, right? Like you have to you have to sacrifice maybe some vacation time or some uh, recreational time, or you have to sacrifice some money-making opportunities. You have to set something else aside, and you give it to the Lord in this act of service. It's really worship, and yeah, these are really good things. Anybody else, what happens when a Christian serves? Your self-worth is improved. Your self-worth, yeah, that's a good point, because you'll see God using you as opposed to as opposed to just thinking about things, it's in real life, your value is there. Like you are being used to impact somebody else. That's going to increase your self-worth and your view of yourself completely. Well, let's look at just these few verses. We've taken up most of the time, but we have about, we have about 10 minutes. So let's see what this passage says about it. So I want you to look at uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and look at verse 1. Therefore... Seeing we have this ministry. Now that word ministry, if you like to circle, underline, mark, whatever, that word ministry right there, we have the wrong idea usually when we see that word. What is the, what is the wrong idea that we have when we see that word? What do we think of? Who said something? You think of missionaries or what else maybe? You see ministry. We have this ministry. Pastors. Yeah, like professional ministers almost. We think they are in the ministry. Well, it's not the ministry, it's just ministry. To minister literally means to serve. Who were the ministers? The ministers were people that would wait tables. It's just like when you go to a restaurant now, they don't, it's, I guess it's, we don't call them waiters and waitresses anymore. Everybody is called a what? Yeah, what was that? A server. Everybody's called a server. They're a server. 
that's what ministry is. It's, we're all servers. And <laughs> you could think of some funny illustrations if you just use the restaurant example of a server at a restaurant and what their place is and how you interact with that person to understand your role as a Christian. But we are servers. And so Paul says this. Paul says he's been given a ministry. Now, the ministry, so this first point on here is to recognize our role in the fact that it began at salvation. This ministry that we've, it's because we have received mercy. And because of that, he says, we faint not. What's he saying there? We faint not. We're not going to what? We're not going to burn out. We're not going to quit. We're not going to throw in the towel because this was given to us at our salvation. And what is the big motivation in this passage? What is the big motivation for why we're not going to give up? Because we've what? We've received. Because we've received mercy from the Lord. And so the, our salvation and the fact of all that Jesus has done for us, everything that Jesus has done for us, this is our motivation to hang in there. Because let's face it, even in the best work environments, like we discussed at the beginning, even when we're accomplishing the very most, we get tired. We start to wear out. We start to, and listen, some days are hard. And as you serve Jesus, sometimes things are going to be hard. Well, if you quit your job every time you had a hard day, your career wouldn't advance very far, would it? Right? But it's the same in the Christian faith. We've just got to accept the fact that, listen, some days serving the Lord is just going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. Things aren't going to turn out right. The people that you work with, just like in your job, the people that you serve with in the church aren't always going to be just how you want them to be. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be friction. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be some difficulty, but it's worth it because the service, the ministry is not about ourselves. It's about gratitude for the mercy that we were given through Christ Jesus. And so we serve him out of that that debt of gratitude that we have for him. That role began at salvation, but it will be sustained by God's power. He's going to strengthen. He's not going to, if, as long as we're relying on him, there's power there. Now, part of this ministry comes from the right, the right personal condition in our lives. Okay? It's very hard to be in the ministry of Christ, but also serving the world. Would you agree with that? Very hard to be in the service of the king when you're living in the bondage of the world. So Paul says a true servant is someone who in verse number two has done what? What have they done? Verse number two. If you're going to serve God, your heart of ministry is motivated by the gospel, but then what's your attitude going to be right from the get? It's going to be what? What is your attitude toward the world? You renounce it. What does that mean? Say, put that in your own words. If you're going to renounce the world, what would you say? What would you say to the hidden things of dishonesty and, the, and craftiness? What would you say? say no. You say no. You say I I have no part in that. This does not. This is not part of my life. Now Paul says he's renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor hand, <clears throat> nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Boy, there have, been, there have been people in the name of Jesus claiming to serve Jesus who have used the word of God in a manipulative way. That's not a true servant of the Lord. Paul says, I wouldn't do that. I don't use the scriptures. I don't use the word of God to my own advantage. I've renounced that, that selfish lifestyle, that deceitfulness, and I handle the word of God carefully, not deceitfully. And by a manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, that's an interesting statement. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. What does he mean by that statement? As the servant of the Lord, as the worker of the Lord, he says, commending, I commend ourselves, him, his fellow servants. What does that mean? That's a little tricky commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 
Anybody paraphrase that? That's a tough one to raise your hand and do that because you're going out on a limb for this one. What does that mean? Frank? It's, yeah, well, that's close. It's the, it's the opposite. So, not the opposite, but the converse. It's, I commend ourselves to every man's conscience. In other words, here I am. This is me, and this is my life. This is how I live my life. I'm going to live it out in the open, and you can make your decision about me where? In your what? Conscience. In other words, Paul is saying this. I am confident that the way I'm living my life I'm confident that the way I'm living my life is acceptable to present to you and your conscience because I'm living in the sight of God. It's all about his reputation and his character. Now, in Corinthians, he's, people have accused him of things. People have, have, and Paul's basically saying this, look at my life. Look at the way I live my life. I am comfortable letting you see all of it you making a determination in your conscience because I am clean in the sight of God. Does that make sense? You understand? So if we're going to serve the Lord, we need to be able to do that. Would you be okay as a servant of God with people knowing all the parts of your lifestyle? Think about it. Answer it because that's service has to come from a right motivation, but we also need to serve with a clean heart and clean hands and a clear, clear conscience. And then we'll finish with this. Part of service is also remembering our responsibilities. So in verse number three, one of the reasons we serve is because we've been, give, we've been entrusted with the gospel. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath, world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach, not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Christ's sake. Paul's mission is to, his, all of the things he does are for the purpose of getting the gospel to the lost and serving the saints. Get the gospel to, the, to, the, to those who haven't heard and serve the believers together. That's a life where we are committed to the cause of the gospel. There's a real labor, a real work, and there will be a real, real reward for that when we stand before the Lord. So that's the, that's the conclusion this morning. And thank you. We had a great discussion. I enjoyed that. And uh... We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, or if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you in our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.